Hello everyone, Yom Tov and welcome to another of your folk tales and fables. This week I've been asked to tell you all about the Delphic Oracle and that was from ancient Greece. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask you to sit back and relax while I read to you what I managed to find out about the Delphic Oracle. And I really do hope that you enjoy it. This is entitled The Oracle of Delphi. How the ancient Greeks relied on one woman's divine visions. Ancient Greece was a world dominated by men. Men filled the highest positions in society. Men fought on the battlefield and men ruled the mightiest empires. No big change there then, eh? However, all these men, from the lowliest peasant to the emperor himself, sought the counsel and advice of one person, and that person was a woman. The city of Delphi had long traditions of being the center, the center of the world. It was said that Zeus himself named it the navel of Gaia. We all know who Gaia is, Mother Earth. According to legend, a huge serpent named Python guarded the spot before it was slain by the infant god Apollo. When Apollo's arrows pierced the serpent, its body fell into a fissure and great fumes arose from the crevice as its car carcass rotted. All those who stood over the gaping fissure fell into a sudden, often violent trance. And in this state, it was believed that Apollo would possess the person and fill them with divine presence. Now, according to historians and archaeologists, whatever was coming from this crevice when they did find the actual Delphic Oracle, when it was discovered by archaeologists, there is a gas that um, comes out of these fissures from underground. And if you're exposed to it for too long, you start to hallucinate. So this may have contributed to people having visions and of course, if the woman involved did have any particular gifts or talents when it came to being a seer or um, a prophet or have any kind of psychic gift, then it would only just enhance those gifts. So that's just giving you a little bit of modern insight into something that happened in the past. That, I mean, there's no guarantees, but that's what present-day historians and archaeologists tend to think. So, like I said, it was believed that Apollo would um, possess the person and fill them with divine presence. These peculiar occurrences attracted Apollo-worshipping settlers during the Mycenaean era, and slowly but surely the primitive sanctuary grew into a shrine, and by then the 7th century BCE, that's before the Christian era, it then became a temple. It would come to house one single person chosen to serve as a bridge between this world and the next. Named after the fabled serpent, this chosen seer was named the Phythia, the Oracle. Communication with a god was no small matter, and not just anyone could be allowed or trusted to serve this venerated position. It was decided that a pure, chaste and honest young virgin would be the most appropriate vessel for such a divine role. However, there was one drawback. Beautiful young virgins were prone to attracting negative attention from the men who sought their counsel, which resulted in oracles being raped and violated. Oh dear. Older women of at least 50 plus began to fill the position 
and as a reminder of what used to be, they would dress in the virginal garments of old. So mutton dressed as lamb then. I've seen a few of those anyway. Sorry, I'm talking to myself again. You know what I'm like. These older women were often chosen from the priestesses of the Delphi Temple, but could also be any respected native of Delphi. Educated noble women were prized, but even peasants could fill the position. Those Phythia, who were previously married, were required to relinquish all family responsibility and even their individual identities. To be an oracle was to take up the ancient and very vitally important role, one of which is to speak fluently, one that transcended the self and entered into legend. Phidia was so important to Greek civilization that it was essential that they were a blank slate. So children, husbands, and any links to previous life had to be severed in favor of Apollo and divinity. The reason for the growing importance of the oracles was simple. The Phidia provided answers. For an ambitious and religious civilization, this very visual and vocal link to the gods was created with utmost respect. For the nine warmest months of each year, on the seventh day of each month, the Phidia would accept questions from all members of Greek society. This was to correspond with the belief that Apollo deserted the temple during the winter months. I think he was having his getaway to Spain. After being purified by fasting, drinking holy water and bathing in the sacred Castalian spring, the Phidia would assume her position upon a tripod seat, clasping laurel reeds in one hand and a dish of spring water in the other. Positioned above the gaping fissure, the vapours of the ancient vanquished serpent would wash over her and she would enter the realm of the divine. The exact origin of the magical vapours, assuming they weren't actually being given off by the rotten remains of a python, remains something of a mystery. And this is where it goes on to say where these it had come from. Excavation work at the temple ruins of the 19th century didn't uncover the sort of cave or hole in the ground archaeologists had expected to find. So much for the 20th century, scholars thought that the Delphic Fault was strictly mythological. That was until the late 1980s when a new team of curious scientists decided to investigate the ruins for themselves. The rocks they discovered beneath the temple were oily, bituminous limestone and were fractured by two faults that crossed beneath the temple. This had to be more than a coincidence. The scientists theorised that tectonic movements and ancient earthquakes caused friction along the faults. Combined with the spring water that ran beneath the temple, methane, ethylene and ethane gas would rise through the faults at the centre and directly into the temple. The low room with its limited ventilation and lack of oxygen would help amplify the effect of the gases and induce the trance-like symptoms experienced by the oracles. So you see it all basically makes sense, doesn't it? Others have suggested that the oracle's trances may have been brought on by snake venom, particularly that of the cobra or the crate snake, which is known to be halluc hallucinogenic, which the seer may have mistaken for divine visions. Of course, one of the most popular theories explaining the state of the oracles is that they were simply faking their trances. Because of the power that the prophecies could hold, it's argued that the priests or the women themselves manipulated the power as they saw fit. And that also makes sense. You want to keep your job? You fake it. Back in ancient Greece, once a story of the woman who could communicate with the gods got us, people flocked to speak to her. Rather confusingly, given the modern meaning of the word, people who requested an audience with the oracle were known as consultants. 
Many of those who wished to ask the oracle a question would travel for days or even weeks to reach Delphi. Once they arrived, they underwent an intense grilling from the priests, who would determine the genuine cases and instruct them the correct way to frame their questions. Those who were approved then had to undergo a variety of traditions, such as carrying laurel wreaths to the temple. It was also encouraged for consultants to provide a monetary donation as well as an animal to be sacrificed. Once the animal had been sacrificed, its guts would be studied. If the signs were seen as unfavourable, the consultant could be sent home. Finally, the consultant was allowed to approach the Phythia and ask his question. In some accounts, it seems the oracles gave the answers, but others report the Phythia would utter incomprehensible words that the priest would translate into verse. Once he received his answer, the consultant would journey home to act upon the advice of the oracle. This was the tricky part. The oracle received a multitude of visitors in the nine days she was available, from farmers desperate to know the outcome of the harvest to emperors asking if they could wage war on their enemies and her answers weren't always clear. Responses or their translations by the temple priests often seem deliberately phrased so that no matter the outcome, the oracle would always be right. It was essential for the consultant to carefully consider our words or else risk a bad harvest or even the defeat of an entire army. When Croesus, the king of Lydia, asked the oracle if he should attack Persia. He received the response, If you cross the river, a great empire will be destroyed. He viewed this as a good omen and went ahead with the invasion. Unfortunately, the great empire that was destroyed was his own. In this way, the oracle, just like the gods, was infallible and a divine reputation grew. To question the oracle was to question the gods, and that was unthinkable. Soon, no major decision was made before dis um, consulting the oracle of Delphi. It wasn't just Greek people, but also foreign dignitaries, leaders and kings who travelled to Delphi for a chance to ask the oracle a question. Those who could afford it would pay great sums of money for a fast pass through the long lines of pilgrims and commoners. Using these donations, the temple grew in size and prominence. Quickly, Delphi seemed to be fulfilling its own prophecy of being the centre of the world and attracted visitors for the Phythian Games, a precursor of the Olympic Games. On the influence of the oracle's statements, Delphi became a powerful and prosperous city-state. The oracle sat at the centre of not just the city of Delphi, but of the great Greek empire itself. No important decision was made without her consultation. And so for nearly a thousand years, the position of perhaps the greatest political and social influence of the ancient world was occupied by a woman. Now there's an awful lot there that I did not know. I really did not know about that. Um, I knew about people obviously consulting the Oracle at Delphi. I knew it was a, was a woman but I didn't know the backstory. I didn't know that if she was an older female like me, and, you know, it's like me, I don't know, going to synagogue every single week and being fairly religious. Um, and then them saying to me, we actually fancy doing a reenactment of having Abraham and Sarah within the synagogue 
as um, sort of a, a bridge between ourselves and, and God. So we've chosen you to be Sarah, but you have to leave your husband behind, you have to leave your children behind, you can't keep, keep anything of any worth, you've just got to live in the synagogue all the time and wear youngish looking robes and you have to become Sarah. I mean, first off, no. Uh, second off, no. It just wouldn't happen, you know, because it just wouldn't. Um, I mean, it's nothing that would happen in our synagogue anyway, but it's silly. But you get my drift, you know. It's like in the Catholic Church, if I suppose if anybody said, we want you to be um, the physical embodiment of Mary, you know. It's it's a sort of a similar sort of thing. Um, but I could well imagine it would be a bit like the, the Vestal Virgins in Rome. You know, something very, very similar. Um, I mean, they did have to be, I mean, the chief Vestal um, was supposed to be a virgin. To be honest with you, from my recollections of Roman history, they weren't always virgins, but they did have a lot of political power. And they were able to advise the emperor. And it was in our best interest to always make sure that whatever answer she gave the emperor was the one that he wanted to hear. Because it was known for vestals to suddenly find themselves no longer vestals. As in ex-vestals. As in you're not alive anymore. So I could well imagine that um, in that sort of position of power, you've got to be on your toes the whole time. So, <clears throat> sorry about that. So, I do hope that you've enjoyed learning about the Delphic Oracle today. Um, I found it really, really interesting. Um, and I'm having a look to see if I can find anything that would be of, um, you know, of any sort of similar interest to us, you know. Um, but, like, you know, it all comes from... I'll tell you who we could look at today, just um, for quickness. We could have a quick look at the, at the Medusa. And... Let's find out about that, shall we? Right, okay. Because, you know, I did it again, you know, I haven't checked to see what time it is. But we'll, we'll quickly um, have a look at this and see what it says about her, shall we? Okay. Medusa was one of the three Gorgons, daughters of Phorcus and Cato. Sisters of the Grey Eye, Echidna and Ladon, all dreadful and fearsome beasts. A beautiful mortal, Medusa was the exception in the family. Until she incurred the wrath of Athena, either due to her boastfulness or because of an ill-fated love affair with Poseidon. Ooh. Transformed into a vicious monster with snakes for hair, she was killed by Perseus who afterward used her still potent head as a weapon before gifting it to Athena. So Medusa, whose name probably comes from the ancient Greek word for guardian, was one of the three Gorgons. And all her siblings were monsters by birth. And even though she was not, she had the misfortune of being turned into um, the Mercedes of them all. Um, now, uh, sisters were called Eurale and Sithano. Um, Medusa was depicted with bronze hands and wings of gold. Poets claimed that she had great ball like tusks and a tongue lolling between her fang teeth. She doesn't sound really attractive, does she? Writhing snakes were entwining her head in place of hair. Her face was so hideous and her gaze so piercing that the mere sight of her 
was sufficient to turn a man to stone. Hmm. But here, it wasn't always like that. Medusa, the only mortal among the Golgan sisters, was also distinguished from them by the fact that she alone was born with a beautiful face. Ovid especially praises the glory of her hair, the most wonderful of all our charms. The great sea god Poseidon seems to have shared this admiration, for once he couldn't resist temptation, and he impregnated Medusa in the temple of Athena. Now we get why Athena was a bit knocked, don't we? You've got a temple to Athena. Just picture it, guys. Temple of Athena. It's supposed to be a religious place. You are not supposed to bonk in the temple. Anyway, you're not supposed to bonk in any religious place. No, it's just that's a no-no. So now we understand why Athena was annoyed. Although to turn the girl into the most hideous snake-headed monster that you've ever seen. And have you noticed that Poseidon gets off scot-free? Typical, isn't it? God attracts woman. Woman falls in love with God. God impregnates woman, annoys another goddess, but it's the woman who gets turned into something freakishly awful. That's, that's just so totally unfair. Um, enraged, the virgin goddess transformed Medusa's enchanting hair into a coil of serpents, turning the youngest Gorgon into the monster we described above. Soon after this, trying to get rid of Perseus, Polydectes, the king of Seraphos, sent the great hero on a quest which he believed must be his final one. Fetch me the head of the Medusa, commanded Polydectes. With the help of Athena and Hermes, and after compelling the grey eye for Medusa's whereabouts, Perseus finally reached the fabled land of the Gorgons. Located either in the far west, beyond the outer ocean, or in the midst of it on the rocky island of Sarpedon. Medusa was asleep, and Perseus, using the reflection of Athena's bronze shield as a guide, so as not to look directly into the Gorgon and be turned to stone, managed to cut off her head with his sickle. And apparently, strangely enough, Medusa's story doesn't end with her death. In fact, one can argue that the most peculiar fragments of our biography are all posthumous. Um, because Medusa was pregnant at the time of her death, and when Perseus severed her head, her two unborn children, Cryosaur and Pegasus, suddenly sprang from her neck. Ooh. The Gorgons were awoken by the noise and did their best to avenge the death of her sisters. But they could neither see nor catch Perseus, for he was wearing Hades' cup of invisibility and Hermes' winged sandals. So they went back to their scheduled abode, secluded, you know, it would help if I could read, wouldn't it? Secluded abode to mourn Medusa. Pindar, a great ancient Greek poet, says that upon hearing of their gloomy lament, Athena was so touched that she modelled after it the mournful music of the double pipe, the Aulos. Now, when Perseus had Medusa's head in his bag, sorry, that was my phone, I beg your pardon, he went back to Seraphos. However, while flying over Libya, drops of Medusa's blood fell onto the ground and instantly turned into snakes. It is because of this that to this day, Libya abounds with serpents. I did not know that. When Perseus arrived in Seraphos, he used Medusa's head to turn Polydectes and the vicious islanders into stones. The island was well known long after this for its numerous rocks. After this, Perseus gave Medusa's head to his benefactor Athena as a votive gift. The goddess set it, set it on Zeus's Aegis, which she also carried as the Gorgonaeum. She also collected some of the remaining blood and gave most of it to Asclepius, who used the blood from Medusa's left side 
to take people's lives and the blood from our right side to raise people from the dead. Okay. The rest of Medusa's blood, a vial containing two drops, Athena gave to her adopted son, Erichthonius. Euripides says that one of the drops was a cure-all and the other one was a deadly poison. Always the protector of heroes, Athena put aside into a bronze jar a lock of Medusa's hair for Heracles, who subsequently gave it to Cepheus's daughter, Sterope, to use it to protect her hometown, Tegea. Supposedly, even though it didn't have the power of Medusa's gaze, the lock could still cast terror into any enemy unfortunate enough to even accidentally behold it. My word, the things that you learn when you start looking at the Delphic Oracle. You dive into the Medusa and then you find all manner of things happening there. And only, only ever in the Haven. You will only ever find this happening in the Haven with yours truly. Because this is the sort of thing that I bring you guys all the time. Something to enjoy, something to think about, and things that we didn't know before. That you never know if you're doing a pub quiz or some kind of trivia. And if anybody wants to know anything about the Medusa, you can say, I know that because you got it from here. Or the internet, or, you know, usual. Anyway, guys, I think that's it for today. I want to thank you very, very much for being here. I want to thank you again for watching me. And I really do hope... Do you know, I just can't seem to help it every single time. And this is why I refuse to edit my videos. Because then it would take away the essence that is this. That is me who constantly makes mistakes the whole time. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you enjoyed learning about the Delphic Oracle and also Medusa, which I wasn't planning on reading, but there you go, two for the price of one. And, you know, if anybody's got any requests or anything like that, coming up for two weeks' time, which is, you know, we do the Folk Tales fortnightly. So, you know, next week you've got your crime. But if you've got any requests, anything to do with Folk Tales from around the world, Roman mythology, more Greek mythology, anything you like, just let me know and I'll see what I can do for you. Okay. Um, my final word is, please look after yourselves. Please take care. Please stay safe. If you need to go out, please only make it for the essentials. The best place for you to stay is at home. If you go out, the coronavirus will go with you. Right? If you stay in, the coronavirus will pass you by. I don't know how more I can say it. If you don't need to go out, don't go out. Please. Right. Thank you again, guys. I love you all. And I will see you very, very soon. Take care. Bye-bye for now, guys.